Hey everyone, Christopher here with a special convention coverage episode. May 5th through 7th, Indianapolis Convention Center was ground zero for the Indiana Comic Convention. I visited this con years ago. Uh, Jenna Coleman was in the middle of her stint on Doctor Who, just to give you some idea of how long it's been. With a large guest list of artists, writers, and celebrities, I figured it was time for a revisit to check it out. I got there on Saturday just after the doors opened and began wandering around. I was only a couple aisles into the expansive vendor floor before I stumbled on a couple familiar voices and faces. None other than Scott and Tracy, the hosts of the Disney Indiana podcast. Stepping onto the floor of the Indiana Comic Con, and who do I bump into but the host of the Disney Indiana podcast, Scott and Tracy. Hi guys, nice to see you again. Nice to see you as well. It's great to see you too. Yeah, this is fantastic. I mean, uh, we usually bump into each other. We have to go all the way out to Pennsylvania for Monster Bash in order to <laughs> usually see each other. Awesome to find uh, everyone a little closer to home. Yeah, we're about halfway from each of us, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like kind of equidistance for both of us. It's, it's, it's nice. How was the drive from Disney, Indiana? Uh, it was it was really good. We took the Sugar Rush car. Nice. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> so you are here. This is the second day for you guys. You're here the whole weekend, yeah? Yes, we're helping out an artist friend of ours, uh, Adrian Ropp, who uh, worked for Disney, worked on the Disney Infinity uh, video game. And that's how we got to, to, to meet him. He's been on our show a few times. Excellent. Very nice. And he's got his artwork here on display. It all looks fantastic. Uh, hopefully he does really well here at the show. Yep. I'm hoping so. Now, uh, will you be able to get away and enjoy any of the show while you're here? We we have been uh, taking turns walking around the floor yesterday. And then uh, today, uh, my wife is going to attend some of the talks. Yeah, some of the panels. And in fact, Adrian will be doing a panel on Sunday. Yes. Nice. And uh, I just blanked on the question I was going to ask you. Oh, uh, I saw you came with like a very distinct, you wanted something very particular this trip. Yes. And you were able to get it yesterday. One, one of the uh, attendees, one of the celebrities here is Paul Williams. And growing up, my parents had a uh, eight track player and we had four eight tracks and one of them was the Muppet movie soundtrack. So I got that signed by uh, Paul Williams and his handler was actually quite shocked to see an eight track. <laughs> I, was, was his handler old enough to know what an eight track yes, was? Yes, she was. Yes, she was. I'll, I'll admit, when you, you, you posted the photo, and I looked at it, and I went, is that an eight track? <laughs> what in the world is he doing with an eight track? <laughs> Yeah, like I said, my, my parents had four E-Tracks in the car, and ironically, two of them were associated with Paul Williams because one of the others was the Smokey and the Bandit soundtrack. Nice. <laughs> Did, you didn't still have that one for him? Did not still have that uh, one, unfortunately. Well, you, you had the good one, the Muppet yes. movie. That's pretty classic. <laughs> it, it, that's definitely something nice. You're going to be able to put on a shelf. Yes. Yeah, yeah. very good. It's definitely going on display when, back in uh, Disney, Indiana. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we've got a a really great guest list here at the con. It should be a good time. And the vendor floor is pretty expansive. I mean, I've only been here a little bit, and I walked down two aisles, and there's just a lot to see. You've got a lot more to see if you've only seen two aisles. Yeah, 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 and I'm I'm looking forward to checking it out. So what's going on at Disney Indiana? Well, we're trying to figure out if we'll have time to see and report on Guardians of the Galaxy before our next show show comes out next weekend. Um, Otherwise, we may be pulling some audio we recorded at the last con we attended, which was Hall of Heroes up in Elkhart, Indiana in March. Yeah, we've got a recording of of a talk with Red Brown, who was the original Captain America, Uh and also one with Lou Frigno. Oh, very nice. So those, if if they're not on the next episode, they'll be coming up soon on our show. Excellent. All right. Well, the link will be in the show notes to Disney Indiana. Really fun podcast. You guys do some nice, uh, some deep dives and just nice discussions over the the films and the all the Disney properties, which. Thankfully, Disney has provided you with a wealth of opportunity. Yeah, when we started the podcast, it was Disney and Pixar, and they keep uh, providing us buying other IP to give us more to talk about. Someday you will be on the top of the heap, I think. <laughs> Until they buy you. Yes. yes. Or maybe that'd be a good thing. You never know. True. A little bit of some of the Disney dollars. Uh, yeah, I, I'm open to negotiations. <laughs> All right, well, it's great seeing you guys, and have fun. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you. After I spoke with them, I kept wandering the vendor floor. As I said, it was big. 
Indiana Convention Center was a perfect place for something like this. It's a fairly large space, and that gave a very crowded convention room to not feel crowded. The convention was really well attended, but you never felt like a sardine in a can or a salmon trying to swim against the current. And I'm not sure why I'm using all these fish analogies. Anyway, despite the crowd, everyone could easily get to whatever vendor they wanted without much trouble, and there was space between the booths wide enough that if there was a crowd, it didn't make much impact on the traffic. The panel and autograph schedule was spaced out pretty well, too. The biggest names had their events spread out enough that if you wanted to catch one and make it to another for autographs or photos, there was enough time. You maybe needed to hurry, but there was no need to run, which was good. As open as the vendor floor was, the halls between the panel rooms and such were pretty crowded. Not so bad you couldn't navigate, but at times it felt like if you stepped too far out from one side or the other, you'd get squished. I was only there for one day, and that was a mistake on my part. They had an expansive guest list, and to fit them all in, they had to take advantage of all three days. And really, so do any visitors. I was also on a bit of a schedule to get home before it got too late, so that again was a mistake. I needed to plan better. I was able to sit on a couple Q&As. One, believe it or not, was the panel with three of the stars of Charmed. Now, I have not watched a single second of this show. But they had actresses Holly Marie Combs, Rose McGowan, and and Shannon Doherty. The latter two of the trio, I figured, might have some interesting stories to tell if they got any questions outside of the Charmed universe. I was not disappointed. One of the first questions came from a young man asking about how the three handled the more difficult and emotional scenes. That led to a great comment about Shannon's occasional role as a director of the show. The voices you hear are in order of the audience member, Holly, Shannon, and then Rose. Hi, my name is Jay. Um, I guess my question is for all of you guys. Um, I objectively think that you guys are some of the most talented people there are. And- Um, so my question is, with the amount of like raw emotion and talent that you guys were able to portray, were there any difficult scenes or episodes or parts of your character that you struggled with that you had to like work extra hard on? No. Oh. All the crying was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a real crier. Like, I don't like to fake it, so sometimes I had to dig to torture myself a little bit. <laughs> Shannon tortured me, too. <laughs> she was like, yeah, it's okay, but you can do that better. I mean, it's great when you, when you direct somebody that you've known for a really long time because you know, you know what they're capable of, and I don't think there was any other director who could look at her and be like, really, is that all you got? <laughs> without getting possibly seriously injured by him. <laughs> so, but I wasn't scared of her, so I was able to push her, it was awesome. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the thing about being an actor is that you just, you have to give yourself over into the moment and and really be in it. And, um, and that's where, like, the true emotion comes from, uh, along with, you know, drawing on experiences from your own life and, and I mean, I think collectively we've all certainly had a lot of um, rough times, uh, interesting times. Collectively, collectively, yeah, yeah. To uh, to draw off of in order to 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 infuse those into our performances. Yeah, I can think we can all say that we all believe that you weren't acting. We all forgot that you were. So. No. <laughs> this one can like crack out of like a single eye. Like she could pick up. I used to say to directors, would you like the tear out of the right or the left eye? Which side of the camera be on? It's bizarre. It just became physical discipline. Probably the hardest for me was just that I had done a lot of roles where I was kind of sassy or edgy and maybe killed some people like in Jawbreaker or something like that. <laughs> so being someone that was helping people and generally really kind, which is, is more who I am, but I hadn't really revealed that. It felt more personally revealing to be so nice all the time. <laughs> well, thank you for your guys' impact and my question. <laughs> I'm wondering, did you have any kind of relief rituals that which you would all do after one of those intense scenes? I don't think we're allowed to share them. <laughs> Later, a young woman who's exploring the career of acting asked for some advice. Shannon was not shy with her thoughts. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Hi, ladies. I'm Samantha. 
And my biggest question is actually for all three of you. As an aspiring actress, what would you say is the best advice to making it in the entertainment industry? And then what would be the one, I guess, struggle you have? Find a different profession. <laughs> Good idea. Um, I mean, personally, I just think that you, you know, if 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 you actually really want to go into it, make sure you're going into it for the right reasons, which is not for fame and not for money, because that's really fleeting, and with it comes a whole other, you know, plethora of problems that you really don't want. Once you get them, you just don't want them. Having to hide in your house. Uh, not being able to, to leave for weeks and weeks and weeks like there are moments when it just feels Incredibly suffocating and so you have to do it for the right reasons and that would be because you um, Love to be someone other than yourself and that you're really good at it And you love throwing yourself in there and you like being creative and you like bringing joy to people or sadness or whatever emotion you're evoking at that point in time um, so and and to and to sort of break into it, I, I have a, no idea anymore. Like, it's just a totally different business, I think, than it was when I first started. But don't know. I won't know. <laughs> but I would say definitely for the right reasons and just to keep the love of acting, the actual act of acting alive, because there is so much rejection and so much brutality in that and know that it's not you, it's just a type, you know what I mean? And don't personalize it as hard as it is. And just to watch out for, you know, I always say, if you don't like quarantine, don't get famous because it is kind of like quarantine at certain times of it. And, but really being in it for the right reason and keeping your heart pure and just don't turn into a dickhead. <laughs> They'll, you know, they will tell you that you're too this, too that, not enough this, not enough that. Um, it's hypercritical. Um, everybody thinks they have the best idea. They don't, usually. <laughs> and, um, yeah, there is that thing, you know, like they said, Razi was, hello, was never more interested in me than when I was either nine months pregnant or had a new baby. <laughs> and it, you feel like a little bit hunted. And it's not fun. Um, you know, but the rest of it, the work of it, the meeting people, and you can actually find your own family. You know, every, every crew is like a family. Yeah. I've been there, done that to kind of give me the idea of whether I should continue to pursue or. Only you can answer that, darling. It has I to be you. I completely agree, but your all's answers definitely help me to move on. So thank you, ladies. You're welcome. So it was a fun 40 minutes. Despite me not watching the show, it was still nice to feel the energy from all the fans and the actors as they interacted. Later that afternoon, I went to the Adam Savage Q&A. Adam Savage, if you don't remember, was one half of the stars of Mythbusters. Or one-fifth if you count Tori, Carey, and Grant, which I do. He now has a YouTube show called Tested. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been like a year since I've done a con. It's so nice to be out. It's so nice to see people in costume. I love also, I know that being uncomfortable is part of the gag. I just love it when I see people being uncomfortable. Because it's just, it's really a key part of the mission. And every time I see someone yanking on something that's biting in, I'm like, yeah. Um, dudes, it's been... It's been really fascinating. Uh, I did not expect at this point in my career to be a full-time YouTuber, but life has never been better. <laughs> Seriously, untested, we're putting out five videos a week now, and I've stopped pretty much developing for television because I, in my shop, 50 hours a week, and I'm, I'm happier than I've ever been. The tested team, the firemen, and all cylinders, we're heading off tomorrow uh, to London to do some coverage of a couple of giant franchises that you all know and love that will show up on the channel later this year. A question came out about the use of practical effects versus CGI. Adam's take on it was really cool. I'm a 3D artist and uh, you inspired a lot of digital like artists, uh, like career generations. 
As the godfather of Google, you have uh, seen the evolution of practical to CGI. Uh, what's your take on old school techniques used in modern CGI? Do you think they still have kick into them? Or are you just like, dreaming a world where everything is just all the effects are just painstakingly miniatures. No, 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 it's, it's a wonderful moment right now. Just the whole reason CG worked in the first place was because of the brilliance of the Rebel Mac group and Dennis Muren and what those guys were doing at ILM. It's all really beautifully covered in the Disney series Light and Magic. Um, but the other reason that CG came ascendant was because of Moore's Law, because of processing cycles. The computers just kept on getting more and more powerful. And that meant that making movies got cheaper, and that meant that rendering stuff got cheaper, and it keeps doing that. Um, but what's happening now is that processing cycles are also one of the reasons that 3D printing is so easy to do, and CNC machining is so much easier to do. And so now, John Knowles, the creative director of Lucasfilm and the effects director on episodes one, two, and I think three, uh, and now on Mando, is literally building motion control rigs for hundreds of dollars in his literal garage. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's because of the same revolution in processing cycles and the and smallening of computing power. So what's great is that Favreau, John Favreau, along with people like James Cameron and Guillermo del Toro uh, and J.J. Abrams, they love practical effects. They're, they love the practical. They love the practical. <laughs> we can figure out what's going wrong. They, they, there we go. They love the practical effects. <laughs> <laughs> they love them, but they can't afford them. And so I still think that practical effects look better than anything. The two best looking science fiction movies in history are Blade Runner and 2001. Yeah. There's not a composite shot in any of those films. In 2001, they would shoot a moon in the right position, and then they'd go build the star liner, and then they'd go composite it, not composite it, they would have that film that they shot the moon on, unexposed, undeveloped, and then they go and re reshoot on the same piece of film for the ship. And so it means that everything that you see on film is a first generation. And that's why Blade Runner also looks great. Uh, and filmmakers know that this is the best way to make a movie. It's also, unfortunately, the most expensive. So I think that what John Knoll is doing right now is initiating a total sea change. And my friends who work in animatronics, like at Legacy FX and Spectral Motion, they're also 3D printing mechs in ways that are making animatronics so much faster to initiate. And I think all of that technology is going to trickle down to us mortals, too. You know, those files will escape. We'll learn how to make a nice trunnion so a mouth mechanism for your severed head prop looks awesome. I'm trying to get a severed head prop of myself. <laughs> that moves. Thank you for the question. This next clip is fantastic. Adam discussing how he works with and around his ADHD. So I'm going to start by saying I really enjoy watching your videos about ADHD. I actually have ADHD symptomology and I really want to be an artist and professional cosplayer, but I struggle with staying focused getting started and staying focused for more than 30 seconds and like yeah. basically my digital art my iPad art app is basically full of like half drawn under sketches what advice do you have um, I love that question I suspect there is a fair amount of neurodivergence in this crowd it is a tough road, and uh, so I, I didn't actually, and I've talked about this on the channel, I didn't really confront how much ADHD was going on in here until I got to spend a, a week driving through the Southwest last year with my son, Thing One. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, you listen to the middle of songs and then move on to the next one? I do too! <laughs> uh, and it was very affirming and also very illuminating and gave me a lot of insight into him. Um, and it, one of the things I found was a wonderful podcast called ADHD Big Brother. And this is a terrific podcast because he's very positive as he talks really openly about, about uh, 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 mechanisms that we can use. He talks about medication. I'm a big believer in medication for ADHD, but also a lot of the ways in which medication is administered is really tough for my son. 
the doctor gave him one dosage of, of Adderall and didn't adjust it for months. And my son, the Adderall made my son hangry and disgusted by food at the same time. It was actually, that's not me, it was actually pretty traumatic. Uh, and so if you, I would recommend medication, but also working very granularly with a doctor to monitor how it's working for you on a day-by-day -day basis to really adjust the, the amounts. I actually was on meds, but they made me aggressive. Yeah, I mean, look, all uh, meds for neurodivergence are always, a, a, they're always a balancing act. There are all sorts of positive effects, and there are all sorts of negative effects, too. Uh, I say this as, I'm not a professional in this regard. I, you know, I'm not speaking in a professional capacity, but I do think it also behooves us to talk about our neurodivergence and our responses to things and our anxieties. Like, it, it's, a, it's an important conversation to have. Um, the other one is keep talking about it. I really appreciate you standing up in front of a crowd and talking about it. That's a big deal. And that is actually also a way in which we can find our communities that can help us stay focused. Uh, because collaborating with others is a fantastic way to do that. So much collaboration here. I love it when a family comes up and only one person's in costume, but you know that this whole unit produced the costume in front of you. <laughs> like that is so. I'm so here for that kind of thing. I've been. I've been. I've been lucky that I've been able to use the the difficulties I've had because of the strengths they give me. Right. I get hyper focus at the same time as I'm constantly bouncing between one thing and the next. And that hyper focus is a superpower. It can also end up being a tragedy. Uh, it is. It is a difficult road to ride. But I, I, like, the reason I'm talking about it is because I'm here to ride it with y'all. And you know, we're just trying to figure out the best path to make things that are lovely and share them with people that we love. Uh, I hope that was useful. Thank you. And the last clip I'll share surrounds something that I think any creative has dealt with. What do you do when you realize what you're trying to do just isn't going to work? Um, so I am an engineer and a cosplayer. And so multiple times throughout my projects, both in cosplay and in engineering, I'll just stop and be like, oh shoot, this is not going to work. So what do you do in those moments if you come across those? Um, sometimes, those are really difficult moments when I realize the whole path that I'm going down is actually just not gonna fly. I often get so upset at that point, I pack everything up and it really worked to pack it up neatly. <laughs> but I often pack it up for like a week or more so that I can really think about a new solution. Because it's usually, you know, in cosplay, the engineering and the aesthetics are so integrated and so integral to each other. You can mess up a mechanic and it's gonna change how you do the aesthetics for a whole line of things that has a long tail. So frequently it's about me, like either letting go of my anger enough to tackle it or letting the anger build enough to tackle it. <laughs> Both work. <laughs> uh, but there's also the sort of a, there's a kind of surrender uh, there's, a, there's a Buddhist phrase, this is what's happening now. And it is, a, it is a really important phrase for me in my life about taking on stuff or dealing with things that are terrible. I've raised twins. I've been divorced. Like, I've been through some shit like we all have. And things get really, really difficult. And there's a part of you that can end up taking it personally, emotionally, and you're like, I just want this to stop which is totally a rational thought. And for me, saying to myself, you know what, this is what's happening right now. You're dealing with, you know, twin poop for another five hours or whatever, whatever thing I have to deal with. Um, and that frame coming into the shop and like in trying to come into the shop with a positivist frame of like, all right, I'm gonna tackle this thing. It's gonna suck for a whole day and then it'll be fine. And then it'll be fine by Tuesday. I hope that was useful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to sit in on a panel with some of the stars of Sons of Anarchy just for Ron Perlman and to see if I got the experience as I did with the Charm panel, but I grossly mis misinterpreted how much time I'd have in Indianapolis that I had to skip it. All in all, I think it was a good con, but only if you have all three days to spend for the guests. If you only want to shop, meh, I wasn't as impressed with the variety of vendors. This is through no fault of the convention organizers, mind you, but I 
really didn't feel like there was a great deal of difference between one booth to the next. Yes, there was some great artwork, but there was also some great and similar artwork at the next booth. And I'm also on the lookout for that one booth that just says, you need to come talk to me, and I just didn't find it here. This isn't the first time that that has happened, but it's always a little disappointing when it does. You can visit indianacomicconvention.com to learn more about the con and, and keep up on what might be coming around next year. And maybe, if I can take more time, you might see me there. Thanks for listening, everybody. If you went to the convention, I'd love to hear your experience. Please uh, send me an email at timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com or follow the link in the show notes to all our social media outlets. Look forward to hearing from you. Bye, everybody.